you were if you couldn't see and you're on some exam table and somebody just starts prodding you with the, how terrifying is that and you can't free yourself you can't yeah, you can't even prepare yourself for what's about to happen it's a pretty terrible situation he's in he's had his visor for so long that his other senses aren't more heightened like some like completely blind people's are or even like my roommates who's legally blind and like some you know if she wears like rings or even fingernail polish that's so like too it's just makes her hands feel heavy because she's more like attuned to feeling things oh it's wow crazy. that's very interesting yeah it's crazy yeah but that's a good point though he has not had that time to adapt and develop that extra sensory that he is missing you know what i mean so that's a very good point that just adds to the amount of terror and helplessness that he's having mm-hmm. yeah it's it's pretty dark for like a star trek episode and and there are a couple episodes, you know, that where Trek can go dark for sure. Um, but when, when you think about the players in this episode of Data and Jordy being best friends from since almost the beginning, and then to have your best friend do these terrible things to you, I mean, it's pretty, it puts Jordy easily in a, in a, in a dark space, like in a, in a, I don't mean that in a pun way. I, I just mean like in mentally in a dark space is what I mean. I didn't think about that as a pun. <laughs> yeah. Of him being blind. That's... And as I said it, I'm like, oh, I don't want it to be funny. No, like, yeah. I, that's why I was I'm like, so I quick. I'm so quick on a dad joke. I was like, shut up, Dan. Don't say anything. As <laughs> as means. Don't say anything. <laughs> well, I mean, Dan being a dad has, I mean, when you become oh. a dad, I believe they give you a book of dad jokes. I think the doctor just hands it to you. I was going to say, yeah. you know, with uh, your child. <laughs> talk about heightened senses. As soon as that baby comes out, like, the dad jokes are just right there. No, they're right there. <laughs> There's no joke, seriously. <laughs> Not at all. Those jokes are no joke. <laughs> <laughs> So with Jordy on the exam table, we we finally find out what this experiment is that Lore is doing. So Data starts by neutralizing uh, Jordy's pain receptors. So I guess that's at least something nice. You won't, fe- won't 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 feel pain here. Um, he then will implant non-cortical fibers in his cerebrum. They basically are there to learn and mimic his neural firing patterns. Then data will destroy the brain cells and the fibers should in theory replace them and take over the brain's cognitive functions. So this all sounds terrible. And <laughs> I was incredible. Incredible. sounds like a good time. Dangerous and risky and, wrong on many ethical levels it's like where's your ethical protocol now buddy and he tells jordy there's a 60 percent chance you won't survive so this is pretty terrible what's happening and then he's like oh but don't worry i've got troy and picard one of you will probably make it and it's like oh boy not a good time at all here um, so this is basically the experiment Lore is performing. The idea that you would eliminate anything organic and that the mecha- that the mechanical stuff would take over. Um, this is his plan to make a superior race of all mechanical beings. So in the next scene, uh, Troy and Picard do their best to uh, get help from Thor Ragnarok. And uh, tricked the the board guard into coming into the cell. Uh, They knock him out. They try to escape, but Data shows up. He's got Jordy. Uh, They all get back into the cell again. And then Picard says, you know, I managed to pull this uh, transceiver off the guard. And uh, he tells Jordy, maybe we can use this to make a Kadeon pulse. So... We get a little bit of techno babble here about, uh, you know, transphasic 
technology, blah, 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 and all that stuff. I um, feel really bad for Jordy in this situation because the last time Captain Picard came in saying something, it wasn't Captain Picard. That's true. Can you imagine like, that? Was- <laughs> oh, man. I feel like uh, hopefully, you know, because I, I think I would like totally been had my guard up. You know what I mean? He's just <laughs> for like, real. I didn't even think about that. He's like, what choice do I have? Right? He's just kind of like, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, thanks, cool, good good job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess, yeah, I, th- I think the only saving grace is that, like, Troy is there, and she's holding his hand, so it's like, I, yeah, but, like, still, the last time you heard Picard's voice, it was Data pretending to be him. So, yeah, not uh, not uh, not the most trustworthy or, or not the most trustful Geordi at this moment. Yeah, I'd be on the defense, for yeah, sure. For sh- yeah, absolutely. Okay, so back aboard the Enterprise, they pull off their plan. They drop out of warp on the far side of the planet. They start beaming people up. I mean, they're using every transporter they got, even in the cargo base. They get everybody except six people that are still left, unaccounted for on the planet. Um, and uh, here comes the board ship again. They got to take off one more time. This time, though, their left the cell is damaged. They cannot go to warp. So at full impulse, they head straight into the sun in the system. And then Crusher asks Lieutenant Bar- Barnaby if he's familiar with metaphasic shielding. Now, this is a pretty funny, well, I thought it was funny. This is a funny little Easter egg in this episode. So previously, season six, episode 22, was a, a episode called Suspicions, where they talked about this new technology called metaphasic shielding. And there was an alien scientist who came aboard the Enterprise named Joe Brill. Joe Brill is played by the same actor who plays Lieutenant Barnaby. That's hilarious. So when she, so yeah. when she asks him, are you familiar with metaphasic shielding? The nerd inside of me was like, yeah, he told yeah, me. Yeah, I mean, she was <laughs> <laughs> That's so amazing. Like, because I, any other way, it was only four episodes before. So, you know, how would he have had time to know about it? <laughs> it is like the funniest he, he, little thing. He had some show. of that plastic surgery that they do so quick that I talk yeah. about. Exactly. Yes, and it's so I mean, funny. It would have be- taken a long oh. time because that guy was a Ferengi. No, he wasn't a Ferengi. Yeah the the guy that made the 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 shield stuff, right? He played Joe Brill, the scientist oh, who died. Yes. yes, he played the. Okay, yes. Yeah, Sorry, and he was I like- totally got thrown. Off. Sorry, everybody. He he was like really tall and yes, blue. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, funny little moment in this episode, which just made me laugh ridiculously. Um, the other thing is there was a recurring character on this show, uh, Brooke, I'm sure you remember, Dan, you, you may not remember, uh, a recurring character called Lieutenant Barkley, <laughs> who was played by Dwight Schultz Barkley. from the A team. This originally, it was supposed to be Lieutenant Barkley in this episode. Unfortunately, Dwight Schultz was unavailable, uh, the schedule and all that. So they wrote this new character, Lieutenant Barnaby, and I guess they got the same actor back to, from the previous time to play him. So anyway, just a funny little nerd yeah. joke. I'm sorry show. that I was I was thinking about the short Ferengi instead of the tall whatever he was because he was like, I don't know, he looked like he was frosty or so. Like, <laughs> he was kind of bluish. <laughs> he know, was. He like did he look a little frozen. like a Frosty the Snowman kind of a thing. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, like Jack Frost. That's what I was trying to think. Oh, of. Jack Frost. Like the, gotcha, gotcha. the Rankin Bass Jack Frost. Not to be confused with the live action Michael Keaton Jack Frost where he is uh, <laughs> looks like Frosty the Snowman. Anyway. Two different Jack Frost. Yes. <laughs> Props on the Rankin and Bass reference, though. Oh, my gosh. I love those. <laughs> All of them. Even the dumb ones. Maybe I should do a podcast about that. So I'm going to talk about it now. So, uh, yeah. So they use this metaphasic shielding to let them stay basically in the sun's corona and hide out from the Borg, because the Borg can't get too close to the sun, otherwise their ship will explode. Uh, So they're kind of just, you know, hanging out 
in the sun. Uh, so back in the holding cell uh, on the in the Borg stronghold, uh, with Jordy's help, Picard uh, has basically rigged this thing he stole off the Borg. It now can generate a Cadian pulse. Uh, and he kind of taps it into the force field to basically use the energy in the force field to generate the pulse. And they'll only know if it's worked if they can basically see a change in Data's behavior. They won't know any other way. And then we do come to that scene that you referenced earlier, Brooke, about uh, Jordy reminiscing about like all the fun times him and Data have had. And it's it, it's a pretty heartbreaking scene. Because I love this scene. Is it okay? Talk about it, Dan. Tell me, t- tell me why you love this scene. I just liked it because it was the <clears throat> excuse me. It was like the final moment, if you will. I mean, jordy has got to sell this. Jordy's trying to get his best friend back, but he's trying to do it in a way where he's bringing up all of the the good times that they had. And he tells this really charming story about when they're on the lake, and he, uh, I believe, uh, you know, it's it's not fresh in the memory. It should be, but he, I believe he fell out of the the raft if i'm not mistaken but he Mm -hmm. fell to the bottom of this lake and then they just have this humorous moment about him having to walk so far at the bottom of the lake you know he's trying to bring back i guess the the i mean you know it's it's data but he's trying to bring back this little inkling of humanity in him something something some kind of light in him and he's doing it by sharing these these best friend experiences i don't know what it was but i just found it to be a really charming scene Mm. it's a very sweet scene because you know, this is that moment where, you know, Data's already told Jordy, I'm going to destroy those brain cells. Right. And Jordy knows a 60% chance he's not going to survive this. He thinks this is it. Like, he's going to die on this exam table on this planet in the middle of nowhere. And his best friend's going to basically pull the trigger. And it is sort of this last ditch. Hey, remember that time we went to the lake and, and we went swimming and you couldn't, you know, you didn't float and blah, blah, blah. It's a great little moment. It's a very character driven moment. And and this is where we begin to see like it seems like Data's ethical program is rebooting because he hesitates. Right. He he says, "Oh, um, you know, there there's some anomalous readings. I have to double check this before we go any further." Uh, okay, thanks, bye. And he just like leaves, you know, and <laughs> I think, and I was yeah. just say, I think with this uh, it has more emotional weight than, I don't know, if they did it in some other movie where it was like, oh, in this movie, it's like the hero and the villain used to be friends, but we don't really have any backstory. Like, we know, even if the, the he's telling Data stories to remind him of what things that, we, that we've never seen, we already know that they have a long history you know, at this point, six years of history of being best friends, mm-hmm. Jordy being his guide, Data's guide to humanity, and them, you know, hanging out and playing cards and holodecking together and everything. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. It's, it's really sad, and it's a really great scene, and... You know, it's like it's like at the same time, that particular scene, not necessarily literally that scene, but that type of a scene has been done many, many times before. But I just like the way that they executed it in this episode because it was that last last ditch effort, if you will. I couldn't even say that correctly. Last ditch effort uh, on Jordy's part to try and save Data and save himself at the same time. I don't know. It just it was um it was perfectly placed. And it was the scene that it was one of the scenes that really stuck out to me. Yeah, and and you know, like you said and like I was saying, it's been used so much, but you don't always get enough weight to it for it to really Sure, it doesn't always stick the landing. Yeah. yeah, and so even this one where we hear stories that we never got to see, it's just, yeah, it does what it's supposed to do. It manipulates us, everyone. <laughs> it, 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 it does kind of manipulate us a little bit. I mean, to a degree, you could make the argument Jordy's manipulating Data here. But Data has been manipulated by everybody in this episode, Jordy in these two episodes. He's doing it for Data's own good. Not, yes. Well, and to save himself. But he, I think he really wants to save his friend. Sure. At least as much as he wants to save himself. And oh, oh, yeah, for sure. Whereas Lore is just manipulating people for power and the heck of it. Just because he mm-hmm. can. I, I totally agree with you. And... And you you said something r- really great before Brooke about how we we've these two characters have six years of friendship 
we haven't seen every single adventure they've had together. So even when Jordy references something that we haven't seen on screen, we believe that it happened because we know these characters. And it uh, it is more impactful than in just a movie. You know, I, I think about kind of the scene at the uh, towards the end of uh, Captain America Civil War 